earned from the wisdom and experiences of highly esteemed speakers, who we regard as worldly, so that we may become better persons in carrying out our duties and responsibilities. I am uh, Sister Zahira Bentin Hazoki from Office of the Legal Advisor, your MC for today's program. Now let us begin with the recitation of Al Fatiha. Amin, Amin, Ya Rabbal Alamin. As of now, we have uh, around 120 participants, including in uh, both in, U in YouTube and Zoom, who are eager to listen to Prof. Dr. Rufani. To all participants, please record your attendance. Link is available in the chat room in Zoom and also IIM official YouTube channel. Now, it is my pleasure to have the Honorable Rector, Professor Emeritus Sanchi Dato Zulkifli Abdurraza to give his welcoming remarks. Please welcome, thank you. Thank you, uh, Sister Zahira. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alamin. Wassalatu wassalam syafil anbiya musallin Sayyidina Muhammadin. Wa'ala alihi wa sahbihi jema'in. La hawla wa la quwata illa billah. Uh, Professor Rosnani, uh, Dr. Lihana, Dr. Muhammad Kamil, uh, and ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to say a few words. I've been saying a few words all the time that this word, few words now, <laughs> gets a little bit, you know, exhausted. Anyway, I am always very excited to join your Muhar Murabi talk because there is no end to learning from experienced people uh, like uh, uh, Prof. Uh, Rosnani. Uh, I got to know her at the very early days when I stepped my foot in the, in the university and we were talking about how to introduce the Fasafah Pendidikan Kebangsaan and, and the rest of it. Uh, as a kind of uh, initiative that will probably draw us on a different sort of level of thinking, uh, given what the falsafa is all about. And I'm very glad that uh, Rosnani has made a very good uh, uh, partner in this particular case, that the books somehow or other get recognized. And I hope uh, this will be a basis of us looking for uh, new approaches, you know, although the framework may, may remain the same. But the, the, the new approaches, I think, will be, will be important for us as we move forward. So today, Education for Wisdom is another level of thinking. I hope that we can try and digest it and put it into uh, perhaps the soft 2.0 and whatever else that we want to uh, lead as far as uh, education is concerned. I do really hope, as I've been saying this all along, that co-ed will be the kind of uh, lighthouse for education uh, moving forward. There's a lot to be done. And I certainly think that this meeting today, uh, with the help of KCA and all the other organizations in the university, will push this agenda forward. So all the best and thank you very much. And we pray to Allah Ta'ala in this blessed Friday that we're given uh, all this uh, hidayah and the courage to make the change moving forward. So Assalamualaikum Warahmatullahi Ta'ala Wabarakatuh. Thank you, Sanchi. Pleasure. I will now hand over the session to the moderator for today, Dr. Muhammad Kamil Cik Hassan. Uh, thank you to our MC sister Zahira Muhammad Zokri, legal officer from uh, Ola. Uh, this, our rector, Professor Emeritus Tan Sri Datuk Zulkifli Abdul Razak, members of the University Management Committee, Associate Professor Dr. Lihana Borhan, Director of KCA, Deans and Directors, Brothers and Sisters. Thank you everyone for joining this Murabi Talk Series session. With us uh, this afternoon, we have uh, Professor Rosnani Hashim, 
um, it is a great pleasure for me to uh, moderate this session. And before we start, let me uh, read through the CV of uh, our Professor Roslani. She is a formerly professor at Kulia of Education, IIUM, from 1987 to 2019. And Currently, she is the consultant for RE Consultancy and Services, REcas since 2018. Her professional qualifications, she completed Bachelor of Science Cum Laude in Mathematics from Northern Illinois in 1976, a Master of Science in Curriculum and Instructions, Mathematic Education from Wisconsin-Madison in 1978, and she completed PhD in Social Foundations of Education from uh, Florida in 1994. She has extensive practical experiences as a teacher and lecturer, a researcher, an academic administrator, a school board director, a teaching practicum and thesis supervisor, and a mathematics and Islamic education curriculum designer and reviewer for the Ministry of Education. She was a director, Center for Teaching, Thinking at Kulia of Education from 2017 to 2019, Dean Kulia of Education from July 2012 until December 2014, Director for International Islamic of Islamic Thought for South, Southeast Asia and East Asia from 2012 to 2014, Chairperson, Board of Director, IIUM Lower Education Center in Berhad, coordinator the Pedagogy of Islamic Philosophy Inquiry Research Cluster. And she received a lot of awards. Uh, some of them are IIUM Academic Icon Award in 2019, National Book Award, Premier Category 2019 by the Malaysian Book Council for the book on Falsafa Pendidikan Kebangsaan. Academic Book Award of the Ministry of Higher Education Malaysia 2020, IIUM Book Award 2020 Towards an Islamic Curriculum, Fulbright Visiting Specialist under the program Direct Access to Muslim World in 2007, and Japan Foundation Research Fellowship in 2006. At the national level committee, she uh, was thus forced member on Islamic Education at Ministry of Education Subcommittee for Educational Advising Council, MPPK, from 2017 to 2019, Executive Member, Malaysian National Council of Professors, Education Cluster from 2013 to 2019, uh, at Hikmah Pedagogy Training Workshop, she is the trainer for the Hikmah Pedagogy of Philosophical Inquiry for teachers and students in schools and universities since 2006. And uh, she also a um, school ho holiday program for school students also from uh, since 2006. Uh, among selected research works that she was a principal researcher, uh, the first one is the effectiveness of the teaching strategies for values inculcation in the integrated curriculum for secondary schools, KBSM. Uh, teaching, thinking, thought, the philosophy for children program for Malaysian children, and the e effectiveness of the IIM diploma in education program. Um, among the publications that she has, uh, the first one is Doing Philosophy for Wisdom in Islamic Education in 2022. The second one, Memugar Semula Tradisi Intellectual di Alam Melayu, 2021. Third, Pentafsiran Baharu Falsafah Pendidikan Kebangsaan dan Pelaksanaannya, Pasca 2020 in 2019. The fourth one, Toward an Islamic Curriculum, Principles and Issues, 2019, and History, Theory, and Practice of Philosophy for Children, International Perspective in 2017. Without further ado, brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, our Saf Murabi talk series this afternoon, uh, I welcome Professor Rosani Hashim, please. Thank you. 
Sorry, can you see me now? Yes. Okay, alhamdulillah. Thank you very much, Dr. Kamal, for, for a very long intro, uh, introduction to my CV. I thought you would have the wisdom to pick and select, okay? <laughs> not to read the whole thing. <laughs> anyway, alhamdulillah, uh, I've been blessed by Allah uh, with uh, such a good life, alhamdulillah. Okay, even all the trials and tribulations are good after what we went through. I would like to thank, first of all, KCA for inviting me uh, to present during this uh, um, rugby series. I think it's really an honor because uh, it's very uh, wonderful to be associated with all the previous Murabis in the series who are giants, okay? And I'm just only a, a small fry, okay? <laughs> Uh, before I dwell into the topic that I've given you, uh, since this is a Murabi series, I just like to share a little bit of my background in terms of teaching, uh, so that you know where I'm coming from. Uh, first of all, I like to uh, thank uh, our rector uh, Tansri for being able to attend uh, this series today. It is really an honor. Uh, we have worked together. And I think we could have worked more together, but unfortunately I had to go for retirement. Okay. And uh, also um, my respect to Dr. Eliana as the director and all my colleagues. Uh, I see Dr. Ratnawati's, Prof. Ratnawati's name there, my former student, uh, Zalifa also, I can see the name there. So uh, to all the other participants whom I've not been able to see in this participant section, okay. Uh, thank you very much for your presence. I hope I'll be able to share with you some of my experience and you can come back without being empty handed, inshallah. So again, as I mentioned, uh, I'd like to share a little bit about the uh, teaching experience as a Murabi. I don't know whether Murabi or Mudaris, Mu'alim or Mu'adi or Murshid, you will, you will have to judge, okay? Uh, frankly, I have taught in Maktar Amda Sains Mara in Seremban for seven years, beginning 1981, before joining IUM 87. I taught after I finished my, completed my Masters of Science in Curriculum and Instruction for Mathematics Education. So actually, if I consider that span of time, plus the time I spent in IIUM, I've taught for about 37, almost 40 years, okay? So that's almost half of my life already, okay? Uh, as we grow old, that means it can to be a smaller fraction. So 1987 was the year I joined IUN, and I believe it's quite historical because that was when the Pasapah Pendidikan Kebangsaan or National Philosophy of Education was formulated. And uh, then you have the Integrated Curriculum for Secondary School or KBSM uh, was launched the following year for the secondary school as a mechanism to translate that philosophy. Now, I felt that the department was established to help in producing the teachers that can do the translation of the philosophy then. Because uh, at a particular point of time, the president of the university was the minister of education, who happened to be Dr. Sri Manoa Ibrahim then. So, the, so there was the commandment to establish the Department of Education in IUM then. <laughs> so, I don't think it's a coincidence, I think it was planned so that we could produce the teachers, deliver the teachers uh, to translate this philosophy. We were a small number then, uh, beginning the, 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 the pioneer group then left behind are still here, Prof Saari, Prof Nawati, myself, okay, uh, the pioneer group. Plus, of course, we had, uh, we were strengthened by giants like Professor Hassan Langulung, Professor Atan Long, Professor Ishak Farhan from Jordan and Professor Mahmoud Rashidan. Uh, they, they, were, they were working in America then before they came to, to uh, IIUM. And I say this is not coincident because when I was drafting the proposal for the formation of the Kuliah of Education in the late 1990s, when I was the head of the department in 1996, okay, and searching for its history as the Mukadima, I saw in one of the Senate meeting, in one of the minutes of the Senate meeting in early 90s for uh, uh, the establishment of the formation of the Kuliah. 
And, and it was stated there that the president had approved the establishment of Quaid. So I was wondering if in 1996, what happened actually when the Senate uh, approved the formation of the Kulia, and even then there was no Kulia of Islamic Reveal Knowledge and Human Science, okay? So the education was supposed to, to come earlier than KRKHS, okay? but it didn't happen. And I think the reason was because the rector at that point of time, Professor Abdul Hamid Abu Sulaiman, okay, the fact that the Kulia did not have the manpower, the professional manpower yet, because at that point of time, besides the four major professors I mentioned to you just now, the rest were all possibly retirees from government uh, teaching at institution. But don't underestimate retirees, okay? I've been to several departments of faculty of education in America where I studied. Most of my professors are not young, they're old. Education is supposed to be people who have a lot of experience. They, they, don't, they, don't, they don't just join there after they finish their PhD or EDD, okay? They must have experience and that gives them the, the, the wisdom and the experience to share with pre-service teachers, okay? But anyway, uh, that was why I think we were all sent, Prof. Nawati, Prof. Sari, myself, we were sent very early <laughs> after we joined, after joining the university, let's say the second or third year, we were sent to study abroad to get our PhDs. Uh, I remember that it was uh, painful for most of us because we still have very young children, it was painful. And I, I had to separate from my husband and two children in the beginning. So it was a big sacrifice for the family. But Alhamdulillah, there's no regret. I think what Professor Abdul Hamid Abdul Salaman did was the right thing for most of us. He wanted, he dreamed, he wanted to see the university staff by people with all doctorates, okay? So after I came back with my PhD in 1994, I was entrusted to be the assistant head of the department of education. And that's a tall order because, you know, uh, and two years later after that, I became the head of the department. And uh, I would like to share my great gratitude to all my senior brothers, Prof. Kamal, Prof. Uh, uh, Arifin Suhaimi, uh, Prof. Uh, Abdul Hamid, because they were all good brothers. I remember when I was the head of the department, and then there has to be KRKS, and then we were put under KIRKHS. So we became the child of KIRKHS. They treated us very well. They guided us. So I feel sometimes I was the only woman in the meeting, but I don't feel strange because I was well treated, alhamdulillah, as a sister, okay? But there's one thing I'd like to share. Uh, when I was appointed as the head of department, okay? <laughs> Before I was appointed as head of department, I used to attend the meeting, the Senate meeting, where my head of department, Dr. Dahnil, attended the meeting. Uh, we were not under KRKHS yet, okay? And I realized that the Department of Education was made, being made fun of. Every time when it comes to education, people will laugh. You know, <laughs> I don't know what happened, uh, but my, my head was fine with that, but I wasn't fine. <laughs> I think it was an embarrassment to be made fun of, you know. So when I was appointed, I wrote a letter to the director. I said, I will accept this appointment under one condition. <laughs> Please uh, treat education seriously rather than making fun of it, okay? So, Alhamdulillah, Allah Yarham, Abdul Hamid Abu Sulaiman, okay? He, he, he held on to that. After that, I think the image of the department uh, arose within the, within the kuliah, Alhamdulillah. So, uh, so let, me, let me share with you uh, about my experience. Because you're talking about Murabi, are we integrated or not, okay? I, I have to tell you that, I, I mean, just now our Dr. Kamil mentioned that I got all my bachelor, master's and PhD in the States. So the question now, did I become secularized because I got all my education in America? Well, the point of the matter is no, I was not secularized. And in fact, my understanding of Islam and interest in Islam is deen and dawlah, you know, something uh, for life. Islam is a way of life, not just a religion for worship, okay? It grew when I was in the States. The environment around me had a definite role to play because, because we cannot deny the will of Allah. 
But my knowledge of Islam grew from a reading of lots of materials in the library. I'm surprised because the American library has so much more materials, whether about Malaysia or about Islam, then I had the opportunity to, to read when I was in Malaysia, even with IIUM, okay? So uh, I also had activities with the Muslim Student Association, especially the annual convention. I managed to interact with scholars, okay? Like Ismail Farouki, uh, all the invited Zanab Al-Ghazali, Yusuf Kardawi. I mean, the, attending the convention helped to increase my knowledge about Islam and seeing the activists, uh, the social activists, okay? Of course, definitely uh, inspired me. And what inspired me most is that when we have talks in the campus, and we organize, we invited people like, let's say, uh, uh, Jama Barzinji of Layarham, from triple IT, then they were then they, there was no triple IT, there was MSA. We had Asham Atalib, they were engineers. And then we have Monzir Kaf, the famous economist. He was an economist. But when they talked to us at the campus, they were really integrated personality. They know economics, they know the Quran. So that inspired me. I because I'm seeing seeing this model in front of me. I did not see this model in Malaysia. But I did not go to university in Malaysia, right? So you must remember that. But at that time, even at, at the high, high, high school, secondary school, I never see this model. So they, they inspired me. They said, that means we can do it. Even if we are scientists, we can do it. Okay. So uh, that transformed me. Uh, in America, I became transformed to live Islam as best as I can. And since when I was a teacher in Mara Junior Science College or MRSM, Islamic values and thoughts were always in my mind to be transmitted to the students within the class that I taught, although it's mathematics, or outside the class where I held or I hosted usra with the students. So of course you would ask, is it easy to teach Islamic values and thoughts through mathematics? It's easy if you're talking about mathematicians. There are lots of Muslim mathematicians. But are you talking about values like courage, you know, integrity and so on? So no, I would teach and after I finish teaching, there's about maybe 10 minutes before class end, I would start talking about Islam. <laughs> there's, no, there's no way of really integrating it through mathematics, okay? But I use the opportunity. Uh, and I still remember when I was teaching them, I told, I asked them, do you think that you will ever be able to, to uh, repay the debts that you have from your for, your for your parents care for you, your mother's care for you. Uh, they said they'll do this, they'll do that, you know, give money. I said, no, you will never be able to repay your parents because there is this man who succumb, who tower around the Kaaba with a mother on, with, his, with his mother on her on the back. And then he went to see the prophet. The prophet said, no, you will never be able to repay your mother. So, I mean, that's how I, I taught them. Basically, I just tell stories. That's why story is a very good uh, means of teaching. And the Quran is, and Allah shows the way through the Quran. There's a lot of stories in the Quran. So anyway, uh, but the point is that I want them to grow up to understand that uh, Islam is a way of life. Islam is concerned about values. And I was very eager to enter IIUM 1987, when I was recruited, they scouted for me, <laughs> Alhamdulillah, I was scouted. So I went for the interview and I was grilled by Professor Abdul Hamid Abu Sulaiman. <laughs> he was the chair, I think Professor Anna experienced the same thing. And of course, I did, not, I did not just succumb to him being what I am. I, I talked back to him, you know, <laughs> and I guess I got the job because I was not silenced by him. And he, I know, I learned later on that he likes people who respond to his uh, provoking questions. So that is how I got there. And I was eager to join IIUM, not because of the position of the status as a lecturer, but because I have a mission. I have a mission, even when in schools, to bring my students closer to God in their actions. Do dakwah, because teaching is dakwah. Nah, you are nimungkar, ama ma'ruf. That is da'wah. So that is my mission. And to let them know God. Okay, so that they can be close to God and God can be the pillar of their 
the pillar, a strength of a strength for them in the future, because life is full of trials. Okay, so I was eager for that because I was thinking when I will be in co-ed or the school of education, I'll be teaching pre-service teachers, and I think the impact will be increased geometrically rather than arithmetically. When I was in MRSM, I used to teach. Uh, you know, every semester, four classes. They gave us four classes. You choose which level you want to teach. And normally, I will take two levels. And I will follow this level until they go from secondary one to secondary three. And then they, they go to different uh, classes again. Okay. And therefore, I will touch only, I say I will touch. I will only touch four classes of student within, let's say, uh, uh, how many years? Three years? Four classes of student. And five years also? Four classes of students, maybe like 120 people. That's how I calculated my mathematics, okay? But if I go to IIUM, I will be teaching teachers. If I can, I can touch the heart of these teachers, that means my effect will be geometrical. So that was why I was eager to come to, to IIUM. Okay? I have a mission. So I kept that mission. Uh, and, and that mission uh, can be can be calculated mathematically as well. So that was that was my background and how I became integrated because I keep on, when I came back, I keep joining Kusra or Halaka where I have to uh, deliver or present the material. So when you present material, although I'm not an ustaza by, by profession, but because I read a lot, I was able to read the Sahih Muslim four volumes when I was in the States plus with some Sahih Bukhari, I, I read the Hadith, I read the Quran, and then we give Usra. So, so the, the ilmu grow and I listen to talk. So that's how, that's how I learn uh, uh, non-formally, okay, informally, the Islamic knowledge. Islamic knowledge we can learn, we can listen to teachers and we can ask. Uh, plus I went for the uh, mathematics, uh, which is uh, 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 the rational science, okay? So, uh, so with that now, I think you have understood. Uh, my job is not just, as we can see later, not just as a mu'alim. Mu'alim only deliver the knowledge or mudaris. But it's also like murabi. You, you nurture the student. And then it is also like uh, mu'adib. You educate them with values, good values to become people of good characters. And of course, uh, not a murshid, I think. A murshid is a different class, <laughs> okay? But it's necessary, okay? Now, let me, let me, let me uh, now I can, I think I will share my screen. Uh, let me share my screen. Let's go to the proper, the top proper. Okay. So many things on the screen. Uh, everything shows. Let me stop again. I can't find my. I can't find my slide. Okay. Sorry, yeah, you have to wait. Um, share screen. Okay. Um, I hope you can see the slide. It's big enough for you. 
insyaAllah. Brother Kamil, is it big enough? Yes, yes. Okay, so this is uh, the topic, is education for wisdom, implications for higher education curriculum. I think this is where SAF would be interested in <laughs> the curriculum, okay? Now, uh, why why bring this topic? Yeah. Uh, I'm talk I decide to talk because there's a choice. There's so many things that you can talk on, but I decided to choose this topic because uh, everywhere in the world, schools are considered as institution uh, which is a reflection of society, society, okay? And society, whenever they have problems, yeah, whether they are drug addicts, mental health, whatever, they will push everything to the schools because they think that the school is the, the institution to solve the problem, to educate the children. It's a panacea for all the illness of, of society, okay? Um, which is, which is, there is some truth, but that's not, that's not the whole truth, okay? Because I think more importantly is the home. We tend to forget the home. And I think today the home has lost its function because what happened is that there is no one at home today. <laughs> Sad to say, okay? Today there is no one at home. Parents are not at home. They're only at home a few hours in the day and during the two, week, two days weekend. So they also cannot play their, their role as they used to. So that's why now schools is supposed to be the place where you solve problems. And this is not really correct because school is not a place to solve problems of society. It's to educate the children, okay? To educate them to have all the char characters and moral and uh, spiritual values that it comes from the, the society, slighter culture, okay? And when the problem doesn't disappear at the school, they start blaming the school. Okay? Then they say, let's revamp the school. <laughs> so, so being an educationalist, okay, sometimes I feel very sad because they've forgotten that the school is a supplementary, not the core. Okay? Anyway, what has happened in the in the universe today, if you look, there's a lot of injustices on Zulum. Uh, which will accelerate to me the damage of the earth, the physical earth, whether the human life or the other creations of Allah, whether they are human, I mean, whether they are animals or they are plants or they are just uh, elements, okay, they will be destroyed. Okay. Uh, why? Most of us can pinpoint this to the science and technology that has been taught. The secular science and technology is unguided. Okay, although in the beginning, science and technology bring enlightenment and we all salute Thomas Edison coming up with electricity because he really brought light to the darkness. <laughs> I mean, whenever you switch on the light at, at night time, don't forget Thomas Edison. That's how much Amal Jariah he carry, carry with him uh, to meet God. Okay, because he was the initiator of that. However, after that, after the, the scientific revolution with Galileo Galilei, science becomes secularized, okay? And today, most of the natural disasters and disruption are the results of years of science that were not guided. Uh, not guided in the sense that they consider, they, they don't look at the sacredness of the other creations because uh, they lost a sense of sacredness lost sense of respect for other creations. Uh, it's more like, it's more like uh, abuse or really, uh, when you say Allah created this Saharalana to facilitate our life, for them, they really make use of this like, like they, are, they are slaves, you know? They can do anything that, that they like. Okay, so that's why as a consequence of this today, there is the... Uh, uh, what do you call the thinning of the ozone layer, the, the floods, the tsunami, all you can see uncontrolled deforestation. And the most important thing is that human beings have lost their humanness. And this is, I think, the, what our dear rector is trying to champion, okay? And bringing back the philosophy, okay? They've lost their humanity, humanitarian aspect, humanness and moral compass. They lack compassion and empathy. And instead, they are being selfish and 
greedy. There is no sense of zuhud among men, okay? There's no sense of zuhud. Zuhud means uh, not being too attracted to the world. Does that mean that you don't care about the world? But the world is not the most important thing to you, okay? So that you must get as much as you can from the world as during your lifetime, no. So you have corruption. Corruption also occurring by greedy people who want more than what they need, okay? And, uh, and sad to say, even the religious people, the supposedly religious people, they were also dragged in into this corruption. So uh, through politics probably, okay? So this, is, this, this background shows that something is wrong. Uh, and as, as we said just now, we got to go back to education. But what's wrong with education? Is it we are not producing people, scientists? We're not producing AI producers and so on? Or is it that our education has lost its wisdom? So that's why I say education for wisdom, OK? So uh, we will try to cover a little bit about ed education, teacher, wisdom and the curricula, okay? That is the content. Uh, I think everyone knows the concept of, ed of education in Islam being with IIUM. I mean, even those not uh, from IIUM, you have the National Philosophy of Education. But basically, education is the instilling or constructing of uh, meaning, okay? Uh, or, or knowledge so that they will give us proper adapt. Adapt is the, uh, the putting of things in the proper place in the order of creation. If someone has adapt, that means you put everything in the proper place. You put the you put the turban on your head. You put the sock at your feet. <laughs> so that is proper place. And when you serve meal, you know where to put the fork and spoon. You know whether you want to use a small bowl or the big bowl. I always have this problem with my mate. <laughs> and I say, I was tell her, you don't have adapt. What do you mean I don't have adapt? You're putting something large in a small bowl. It's not adapt. No, it's not proper. Okay. So any, anyway, adapt means if you have adapt, you have put things in the proper place. In the odd. And the most important, the most uh, important adapt is adapt with God. Education should give you the ability to recognize and acknowledge uh, God. Okay. And man's relationship with him. So this is Alata's definition. Actually, if you look at his book, Concept of Education in Islam, but it's not just his. You can get it also from the Greek. You can also get it from uh, Al Ghazali. Okay. <clears throat> so if you know the the adab, then you know also your role as Ab and Khalifa. <coughs> now, uh, adab is related to Adil. It's related to Ikma. <coughs> oh, excuse me. If you have adapt, you put things in the proper place, then you are adil. <coughs> Justice is putting things in the proper place. That comes from Plato. But we also say putting things in the proper place is adil. Okay? But how do you know things are in their proper place? <coughs> how do we know how to put things in the proper place? That is ikmah. Ikmah is the knowledge to know the proper places of things. Hmm. So with proper education in Islam, <coughs> you're supposed to, be, to get increase in your faith. You see this definition of faith uh, is really uh, put forth by Sayyid Naqib. He want to uh, relate education and faith. Okay, he want to say that everything is for God. Okay, so if you have if you are properly educated, you should be religious. Religious in the sense of Islamic sense, okay? You have hadab, you can be adil, and definitely you must have been given hikmah. <coughs> okay? So ultimately, uh, Prof. Tansri used sejahtera. <laughs> in our book, and National Philosophy of Education, we use sejahtera. But I like to stick to Sa'adah. Sa'adah is translated into English as happiness. Sejahtera, Prof. Francis said, cannot translate into English. <laughs> so that's why you go to Korea, you go to United Nations also, UNESCO, use Sejahtera, okay? But anyway, Sa'adah is happiness, the English term for it. So in this sense, 
Said Nakib Alatas and Aristotle have the same conception of the aims of education is for Saada. So how do we get Saada? And what is Saada? Actually, this is where there might be a little difference between Sejahtera and Saada. Because when you have, you have Saada, when you have a lot of certainty and yakin about God, and everything is dependent on, on Him. So when you have a strong yakin, you don't care. You, have, you are going to be very courageous. You're going to be very brave. Because nobody can kill you if God does not will it to be so. So that is your yakin. So how did the quality generation of prophet came about? Because they have a lot of yakin. Even if they go to war, they are not afraid of dying. Because either they win, either they are alive and win, or they lose and are dead. Both ways they win. Because if they are dead and they lose, they are going to give they're going to give uh, to be so, so, so that's their yakin is very high. So how did they get such high yakin? Maybe you can say, well, the prophet is alive among them. But, but there are people, the prophet was alive among them, but still they were not yakin. So to get that, you have to go back to the bottom line. Bottom line is, we have to know our kitab, we have to know our hadith, and the knowledge related to that. And then we have to know the nature of creation the plants, the animals, and then we have to contemplate. From that, we will get to know the knowledge of God, truth, right and wrong, ethics. And then, we will, inshallah, you will be gifted with wisdom by Allah SWT. Wisdom, you can act wisely. Then you get the, the pleasure of Allah and you reach your state of sa'ada. So this is, uh, that's why uh, you need both knowledge because you cannot get sa'ada just by looking at uh, creation and contemplation. Uh, but you can know God, definitely. Uh, if you look at the story of Haib Nuyak Zan, Haib Nuyak Zan, in that story, he tried to tell you that there are two ways to the truth. One is someone through the kitab, the other one is through looking at nature. So you have to read that, okay? Now in education, since education is about men, what we educate is related to men. So what is the nature of men? We know that man has several dimensions, okay? It's spirituality, it's social, moral. We said in the NPE or FPK, Jerry, just money, emoji, uh, what, uh, rohani and intellect. So here yeah, we have spirituality, uh, intellectual, physical, but you don't have emotion, okay? But moral, social, cultural, interpersonal, they, they are all belong to the same thing, okay? You can put them together under human, human uh, uh, <coughs> morality and social, okay? So if you want spirituality, this is the literal the outcome. Then, what is uh, this? The, this is the man you are, you want God consciousness out of him. From moral, develop the character. From intellectual, you develop you need knowledge. Okay, physical, healthy living, and so on. This is Daud Tauhidi. Okay. So you look at the literacies. You look at the outcome. So how do you reach the outcome? You look at these processes. If you want God consciousness. You have to teach children to have reverence. Reverence for what? Reverence for the majesty of God, for example. Or the majesty, the, the goodness of man himself with conviction. Noble character, you have to have compassion, self-awareness, uprightness. Intellectual, this is where most of us adapt with in the university. Competence, knowledge, problem solving, deep understanding. So we spend so much time on this, on this aspect. Physical, I think it's not so difficult as long as you, are, as long as you play uh, games and so on. And then the three things I mentioned just now, these are related to your character and society. So you have understanding, cooperation, inspiration, integrity, courage, that is character. And then justice, responsibility, and role model. So this is what we, if we look at men, 
the outcome that we want and what are the processes 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 that are necessary now so who is the excellent teacher okay just now uh, we said a teacher can be a murab, a muallim the five things prof tahir has elaborated this in his uh, series on the murabi series okay i always remember max sobel because when i was doing my masters for math education i used his book on uh, uh, enrichment and strategies and he, i like his quotation the teacher must know his staff he must know the people he intends to staff and he must staff them artistically okay even from these three you can see it covers a big domain of education first of all you must have a specialized knowledge that means you have something you want to teach either psychology or mathematics or whatever subject matter you but you must know your stuff this one the pupils that means you must know your target group are they adolescent are they children and then you must know how to deliver however this is max sobel i would say that you're talking about the muslim teacher ah as i told just now he must know his mission so whether you're muallim mudarris murabbi muaddib murshid you must have a mission and you must know your mission otherwise it's just passing time what a sad thing okay and that mission is like your niyat okay and then you must be an exemplar or could work of excellent characters the prophet sidiq 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 amanah tablik patana right and, and all these other characters okay so that is excellent teachers and i got and i got these two things here from the function of the prophet himself look at the prophet allah says in the quran wallazi ba'atha fil ummin rasulun minhum yatlu alayhi ayatuna wa yuzakkihim wa yu'allimuhum kitab wa hikmah i only know this for until here <laughs> so what are what are the mission of the prophet to rehearse to them his signs to sanctify them to instruct them in scripture and wisdom so look to rehearse to them his sign what sign are we talking about here i would say that this is nature in in tabii okay because if i say this is kitab there's repetition here that's useless so to rehearse to them his sign look out there look out there travel okay in the quran it says a lot of these things to sanctify them that means purify their soul because if the soul is not purified that's where corruption or fasad will come in okay? all the evils come in and then then you instruct them in the book and wisdom so in some some places wisdom is because of this ayat the context of this ayat it can mean sunnah or hadith but in other ayat wisdom doesn't mean sunnah as we shall see later on so if you look at this umur rabbi if you want to be umur rabbi oh because umur rabbi only only uh, nature okay that's why said nakib alatas he doesn't use the word murabi he said murabi even even animals are murabi because they raise their young ones okay so that one disqualify men to him is more muadib because you give adab and animals cannot give adab yeah so this is uh, the discussion if you were in my educational philosophy class this is the discussion whether muadib murabi we follow said nakib is muadib murabi is too general even animals have, have that okay so what does an excellent muslim teacher need Ah, uh, his staff means knowledge specialization. His arts is pedagogy and instructional tools. His pupils, they you have to know the nature, the sociological foundation, psychology, sociology, history. These are all very important philosophy when you talk about human being and the direction of education. Okay, and then his mission. Where you find your mission? This is knowledge of the Quran, the Sunnah. You know, ah, uh, fiqh. Arabic Islamic legacy if you have given your pupils your students this in good quantum in proper proportion inshallah you will be producing the integrated holistic individual who is sejahtera or who has saada inshallah okay so teaching is not just technique okay it comes from identity and identity and integrity of the teacher okay our ability to connect with our students and to connect them with the subject depend less on the methods i use than on the degree to which i know and trust myself with so you look at the good teachers they have a strong sense of personal identities 
student can make lots of comments. You can tell that this is really Prof C's life. <laughs> I mean, you can, you, you yourself were student before, okay? They have integral and undivided self when they teach, they are there, you know? They manifest whatever they teach in their own life, they walk their talk. They use method very widely, can be lectures, Socratic dialogues, lab, collaborative problem solving, and so on. And the connections are not held in their methods, but in their hearts, the place where intellect, emotion, and spirit will converge. So this is the, 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 the role. The role have the akal, okay? Uh, uh, the the roh, nous, akal, nous, kal. This is where everything comes from inside. So you can see the sincerity of a person, a sincerity of a teacher who is really sincere when he or she teaches, okay? So what is learning and education? If you, you look whether from, just now we look from the Islamic, now we look from the Western, even the Western psychologists like Brunner will say learning is making sense or understanding the world and themselves. Mana is making sense, looking for meaning. Mana. If learning is about sense making, then the goal of instruction is not to shape behaviors or skill, but rather to influence conceptual development and deep understanding. So in other words, when you say conceptual development and deep understanding, I would agree that when Arata said that we should give them our worldview. Because if you teach them, and I think this is, this is in our uh, core course, worldview, because if you have the proper worldview, you will understand concepts and you have a deep understanding of things, not just behaviors, okay? And from there, it's reflected in your action and in your words and your deeds, okay? And according to uh, some, education is primarily a drawing out unfolding of the individual's potentialities not dispensing of information or instilling of learning. It's already, they all have the potential there. So Katik will say that a teacher or a lecturer is like a midwife. What does a midwife do? A midwife draws the baby up. So the baby is already in there. The midwife did not create the baby. So every one of us has the potential to speak Japanese, to speak Russian, you know, <laughs> but nobody drew it out of us. So we did not speak Russian but we speak Malay and English because someone took the effort to draw it out from our potential. So this is the Socratic uh, definition of education, okay? And a conception of learning that focuses upon understanding has serious implications for assessment, okay? Because something has gone wrong with education. We are more focused now on behavior and skill rather on this understanding. We'll come later on, inshallah, okay? So education for meaning, just now we mentioned Brunner and then Alatas. Alatas say, ilm is the arrival of meaning of something or an object of knowledge in the soul. Alatas give two choices. Either the soul is active or the soul is inactive <clears throat> because in Islam, the soul is, can be inactive and you receive, just, you receive knowledge just like, you know, the astro, astro uh, what do you call this, um, parabola? Okay, and your heart is your ready to accept the, the message that the parabola sent? If it is clear, if your, if your parabola is clear, okay, the satellite will send it to your parabola and the picture on the screen is very clear. But if your parabola is blur, the satellite send the, the, the rays, the light, you see only, you know, like raining <laughs> on, your, on your TV screen. So that's why Alatas gives two definitions the arrival in the meaning of the soul or the soul arrival at the meaning. So either you seek for it, so that's a quiet knowledge, or it's given to you, revealed to you intuitively, okay? That is the, the, the what they call this, the knuckly knowledge, okay? And, it, and the Yale psychologist uh, Sternberg, but I don't think he's Yale anymore, okay? Maybe he's retired too, okay? He said that today we've been too focused on intelligence, but not wisdom. And wisdom is very different from intelligence. And finally, Iliad. Not idiot, nah? Iliad. <laughs> the, the American uh, literary uh, figure, okay? He asked, okay, as we pursue more ICT or more AI today, where is the wisdom that was lost to knowledge? and where is knowledge that was lost to information. So you see uh, people drew out these 
this pyramid, the base is wisdom, and the tip is data. What we see, what we collect is data. Data is the, the atom of information, okay? And then this data, when you structure it, it becomes information in a certain context, okay? And knowledge, when you put it to little use, and then wisdom means the proper use of that knowledge, okay? So this is uh, education for meaning. This is getting lost in our education today, okay? So this is the cycle in search for wisdom. So you have, uh, we started off with IQ. I, I, ah, Binet, I was trying to remember what, who's his name? The French man, Binet. Binet was the one who started IQ, okay? Then people got dissatisfied with it. Then Goldman came with uh, EQ, bringing in the emotional sides of men. So there'll be self-awareness, there'll be, uh, uh, self-awareness, self-regulation, okay? And then there'll be uh, empathy and motivation and compassion and social skill. So this is missing and this is what they brought in. Goldman brought in that. And then there is multiple intelligence. There are few intelligences because they realize that people don't learn the same way. Some learn better by, by kinesthetic dancing, for example. Some learn better through music, some through visual some through logic and math. So, so because of that, they say, if you want to uh, give the child equal opportunity, you must look what is his uh, inclination in terms of getting learning, making sense of things. So, so that's why uh, they have this multiple intelligence. And in fact, this is this instrument even to, to detect what is the inclination of the student today. And then they can guide the student. He is a good in linguistic, or you become a journalist, or you become a writer, or a speaker, and so on. So they can, they can, they can. As a counselor, they will know where to channel the student. And and then they, there was the critical thinking movement. So you have critical thinking, and then you have creative thinking. Still, Sternberg say <coughs> there's a failure. Okay. So he said that what is missing is practical intelligence, the wisdom. That's why I say yes, we are not having the wisdom. That's why we can have people high IQ, <coughs> critical and creative sometimes, but still they're not successful. Especially if they have a uh, high IQ, but they don't have the other intelligence. So, so they, they, they're not successful. So he said it's because they are missing wisdom. <coughs> or the term used is practical intelligence. Okay, so that's why we have been round in a circle <coughs> in search for wisdom. So we finally land back to where we began in our history, when we had philosophy, <coughs> which means love of wisdom. Now, how, how did we land ourselves in this trouble? Sorry, eh? I haven't been talking a lot. Problem with education began in the 80s, when I was still doing my master's degree, <laughs> our professors were already talking about the market and business principle entering into education. <coughs> so you see, even secular education, it had to change when principles from market economics began to enter education in the 80s. I remember we were reading the book by CBB. CEBB on quality of education. It deals with uh, United Nations, I think. And they were already saying, but why are we bringing all this market jargon? Customer, like, you know, a stakeholder. And then we have, <coughs> and then we apply. If we apply the business model, we have outcome based <coughs> education. The problem with outcome-based education is focused only on external value of learning. The performance on the test is more important than the learning that facilitates doing well on the test. It's not the learning that's important, it's the performance. It's the outcome, isn't it? The performance, okay? Learning has become subject to the instrumental ideals of efficiency and accountability, <clears throat> that which is easily tested and measured, and the ranking of individuals and or institutions. Why? Why this? Not the understanding anymore? <coughs> not the meaning anymore? Because they are not easy to measure. But if you look at the outcome, 
any one outcome even with the behavior is like uh, what's his name skinner okay they want to measure if it can be measured then it's good if it cannot be measured then don't put it in the lesson objective okay so in this context assessment has developed into a quality assurance mechanism so we talk about where was quality assurance before in education <coughs> didn't exist when i was a school student didn't exist until we came to the university and more so now than before quality assurance mechanism validates the transfer of measurable knowledge and skill from the expert to the novice so uh, i have some definition of wisdom here before we talk more uh, because i've been saying the word wisdom <coughs> i've given i've given you a very simple definition things in the proper place but, but i didn't give you uh, i say it's just the knowledge okay <laughs> That will tell you how to put things in the proper place. But if you look at the dictionary definition of wisdom, uh, Oxford Dictionary is the capacity of judging rightly in matters relating to life and conduct, soundness of judgment in the choice of means and ends, sometimes less strictly sound sense, especially in practical affairs in opposition as opposed to folly. So you see the capacity of judging rightly in matters relating to life and conduct. So this is very important. Huh? Very important. Suddenly you, you decide to marry, you want to marry, and you have two candidates in front of you. That's a matter of life. <laughs> so how do you judge which one is the right one for you? Okay. Uh, soundness of judgment, the choice of means and ends. Okay. So that very strong definition. Another one is common sense and good judgment. Say, according to Henry David Thoreau, another literary, 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 literary uh, person, eh? it is a characteristic of wisdom not to do desperate things. Okay, So if you are this wise, you don't do desperate things. Okay, Or the sum of learning through the ages, there is knowledge, or this is like Wisdom of the West, wisdom of the East, wisdom of the past, okay? Wise teaching of ancient sages, soundness of an action or decision, this is the same like the first one, okay? And then we look at the philosophy, philosopher's definition. One basic philosophical definition of wisdom is to make the best use of knowledge. Very simple definition. To make the best use of knowledge is wisdom. wisdom. So that's why you have wisdom as the base before, after knowledge, yeah? But to Socrates and uh, Plato, philosophy, love of wisdom or love of truth, okay? And wisdom is where I told just now for them is putting things in the proper place, okay? Aristotle says, the understanding of causes of knowing why things are in a certain way, that is wisdom for him. <clears throat> See, Aristotle is very scientific, right? Because of his scientific mind, that's why we have a lot of science, empirical science. But he didn't begin it. Uh, even in the Muslim world, there were already empirical sciences before him. Okay. Oh, sorry, sorry, no. <coughs> he was in BC, so I guess he was earlier. <coughs> and then a oh, contemporary philosopher, I, I like this definition. Let's reflect, okay? He says that academia ought to alter its focus from the acquisition of knowledge to seeking and promoting wisdom, which he defines as the capacity to realize what is of value in life for oneself and others. Capacity to realize what is of value in life for oneself and for others. That is wisdom. And that is something that we should be focusing on rather than acquisition of knowledge. Okay. So there are many words of wisdom in the Quran. That's why yeah, see in the Quran is Hakim. In the Quran, full of wisdom. So there's a lot of wisdom. But don't 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 think that the wisdom that we mean here is just the wisdom that is stated in the dictionary definition just now. Because the wisdom in the Quran means it's more about after life as well, the year after. It's meaningless if you spend so much time, so much effort in this life and you forget about the, the other life. You don't know about the other life, you ignore about the other life, and you will end up 
to be doomed. That means you are not wise. So that's one of the wisdom that is in the Quran, okay? And there are, uh, this is the, the one I meant when we say that Allah gave wisdom. It's not something that you, okay? He grant wisdom to whom he pleases and to he to whom wisdom is granted receive indeed the benefit of playing. But none will grasp the message but men of understanding. So Ulul al -Bab. yeah? So Ulul al -Bab means people are late, who have wisdom also. So in other words, if you look there, that means Allah gave wisdom. He gave wisdom to, if you look at the Quran, he gave wisdom to Solomon, he, Suleiman, he gave wisdom to Dawood, he gave sister, wisdom to Yahya. He said that, I've given you wisdom. So in other words, this is what Allah gives also, okay? Not just our experience and our knowledge. Uh, certainly we gave wisdom to Luqman, see? And what was the wisdom he gave to Luqman? Be grateful to Allah. Whoever is grateful is only grateful for his own soul. And whoever is ungrateful, surely Allah is self-sufficient. Praise. So now this is this is a wisdom. This is one wisdom in the Quran that Allah stated very explicitly. Nisra an nal invite all to the way of thy Lord with wisdom and beautiful preaching. So you want to do da'wah? You must abide by this principle and argue with them in ways that are best amid and, and most gracious. So, so these are words that use wisdom. <clears throat> some is from you, some is from the gift of God, okay? So I like to share Shai Bani, a uh, educationalist, Muslim educationalist from, uh, I don't know which country, Middle East. Huh? His book was translated by Professor Langulung. <coughs> He said, wisdom is maturity of thought, far-sightedness, understanding and observation that cannot be achieved through him, cannot be achieved through him. And wisdom has five elements. It's universal. Somebody is, with wisdom is open-minded, intelligent, contemplative, able to translate knowledge into action. Yeah, that is what wisdom is about, translate knowledge into action. So the rest are just explanation. I don't think I was to, have to go through that. And then wisdom, uh, there are certain things about wisdom related to faith and ethic, okay? Wisdom is related to context. So it's not, it's not fixed. It cannot be imitated, okay? Uh, it does not take whims and desire as our God, if you're wise, okay? It's not limited to specific manners. It can, that can be used only at a certain time. I mean, the ulama can act differently on two different occasions. For example, in one occasion, Imam Shafi will say, if you want to buy a house, you don't need to look at the house. But in another place, say, you have to look at the house. Is he being inconsistent or is he being wise? And then you look deeper. Why did he say that you don't have to look at the house? Because the, the one that he says you don't have to look at the house is because these are like our taman, you know, housing estate. We have the same house, right? Same passion. Everything is the same. So whether you buy house number one, house number two, it's the same. So no need to look. Lah. It's the same thing. Maybe it's defective. That one they have to repair. But in the other place, there are bungalows. And they are built of different shapes. So you have to look. Okay? So that doesn't mean that they are inconsistent. It just means that they are wise. <coughs> Wisdom paves the way to reality, the real meaning of the world. Okay? And... The wise does not think just for the sake of thinking, but to arrive at some solution, to be of some help, to find the truth, and to produce beneficial results. They use the Quran as guide and uh, think most of how to achieve Allah's love and approval. So they are close to God anyway. That's the point. So wisdom bring with it good manners, sagacity, decisive speech, and effective oratory. Not really a skill, but from the sincere heart. If you can speak well, not just not necessarily is oratory, okay? But maybe it comes from the heart. Most likely it comes from the heart. Uh, superior analytical ability, attention and clear conscience, strong personality never compromises the truth. And Allah's help and support. So that was okay. And the obstacle wisdom that's causing a lot of destruction to our universe today is either because the shirik, they value persons or think more than Allah. They are ghafla, 
it heedless, cannot see, sense, or be aware of the reality around them. Greed, complying with shaitan, which can be man or jinn, okay, and distrusting Allah. So this is some obstacle. Forget about this story, yeah? no time for story. Now let's go to the second part, there's a curriculum. <laughs> Sorry, I'm taking a long time. Huh? Uh, now, I'm sure you have heard of this book, Excellent Without a Soul, How the Great University Forgot Education. Of course, this is written by one of the dean of Harvard University. He was criticizing how Harvard runs its program. And it was very sharp critic, okay, in uh, early 2000. Uh, and it's due to the same thing that we mentioned just now. He says that he shocked the academia with a sharp critique of the blend of incremental decisions and mission drift, allowing the market to control the academy. So we are not the first one, Tansri, yeah? even in, <laughs> in, in Harvard, they already complained about this, but it got nowhere, I think. He argued that universities have lost the sense that their educational mission is to transform teenagers whose life have been structured by their families and their high school into adults with the learning and wisdom to take responsibility for their own lives and for civil society. So they should be able to transform their students to, to have that, okay? Responsibility, responsibility for their life and for their civil society. But they are not doing this. That's what uh, De Luis was saying. And today education is more focused on employment. So you have graduate employment, and then it's a business or commodification of knowledge. Gone are the days education is for moral, ethical, and spiritual enlightenment. <coughs> Even goal of Islamic study education seems to boost cost <coughs> for better results. Study are for exam and not for meaning, so there is no wisdom. Gone are the soul and the mind of Islamic education even. So what is the soul of education? We have discussed the aim just now. So from the Islamic perspective, the soul of education is in understanding and benefiting from the science of God and his book, Verification the Soul, what is the mission of the Prophet just now, okay? But this seems to be lost as a result of Western colonization that planted secular education. That's how we lost our soul. So uh, the problem with existing Muslim education curricula. First, in most Muslim universities, the unity and hierarchy of knowledge have been lost. Maybe we say that Muslim, not Islamic, okay? That means universities in the Muslim world, <clears throat> since they follow the secular model from the West, they also have lost their unity and hierarchy of knowledge. I will show that again what, uh, uh, afterwards what I mean, okay? Secondly, the curriculum structure is compartmentalized without a core to give the unity of knowledge. There's no core, okay? And third, contemporary aims of education are driven by utilitarian and pragmatic aims rather than Islamic educational goal. And when university curriculum fail, they will also fail the schools because school models themselves after the university. So we have source of knowledge, no need for these kinds of knowledge. I think when we talk about unity of knowledge, because there are different kinds of knowledge, although there are different classes of knowledge, there is a unity because it's created by the same creator, okay? So we have the Fardu Ain, we're talking about uh, responsibility, then you have Fardu Ain knowledge, for individual and for the Kifaya knowledge, for the, for the community. And then if you're talking about the sources of knowledge, you have the Naklia, the reveal, and then you have the Aklia, the quiet. And then you can also have sh uh, Sharia and Aklia. So these are Ghazali's uh, classification, okay? And then they have different modes. They have different modes and different kind of truths, okay? So one is the revelation, the other is uh, empirical and rational, okay? Now, uh, if you look, let me see, did I miss, did I miss the diagram? Just let me just go back. Oh, no. Not yet then, okay, sorry. So this is al farabi classification of knowledge. What we have in university today, you will see that it is really Al-Ghazali's classification. If you look at al farabis classification of knowledge, al farabi is linear. He began with science of language, and then logic, and then mathematics, science, and engineering, physics or natural science, metaphysics, and then society. Why like this? Maybe for those who have been reading, they will understand that uh, Al-Farabi give a mode of understanding that there is a prerequisite knowledge for every of this uh, branch of knowledge. Before you can study maths, or logic, 
you have to have language. Before you can study mathematics, you have to have logic. Three is greater than two. You have to know that, okay? So this, this and then before you can learn physics, you must be able to, to learn mathematics because physics has a lot of formula. E equal MC squared. They got the formula from nature. They're able to capture the formula, okay? And then you want to learn what metaphysics, theology. Then you have to know all this. And then after you've studied theology, then you can go to political science, fiqh, kalam, you know, because this application to society, this small application. Now you have been grounded. So this is, this is something that we never considered. I'm saying that when I look, this is something nice, okay? Uh, this is a uh, Farabi classification. But of course, we applied it without knowing so, okay? We applied it. <coughs> and then we have another uh, class, which is Ikwan Asafa. You have, they divided knowledge into three categories related to our living. So we have the religious sciences for our, for our akhirat, philosophical sciences for our mind. So the mind, the spirit, and then for our body, the primary sign, the riadia. The, the the mathematics, the business, this is so they, they divide it nicely. They have uh, the mind, the spirit, and the body. Anyway, <laughs> so Al Ghazali's classification is the same as the first world conference on Muslim education classification. That is uh, Ulum Sharia, Ulum Akliah, Padu Ain, Padu Kipaya, the one that I showed you in the beginning. Okay, so. But the problem is, I think there are confusion when you use Al-Ghazali's way because he has two far, fardu ain, fardu kifaya. So fardu ain is for the individual. So we tend to focus on the fardu ain, whereas he used the word both is far, fardu kifaya. So we tend to leave behind medicines, uh, the sciences. And now we can see in, in, in Malaysia, there's complaint that nobody wants to do science, natural science. I mean, not nobody lah, but very few. <laughs> Because it's harder than, than the other one. The other one is just memorizing. Okay? So this is there's something wrong. So that's why if we use, we use this classification, we will get, we will end up like this. A lot of mushrooming of tafis, madrasa, and so on, which neglect this uh, fardu, fardu kifaya sciences. And there we, we are, we, we will lose in terms of the balance. Okay? So if we observe this, Al-Farabi basis on human quality development, he gonna suffer on the three natures of man, mind, body, and soul. Al-Ghazali based on the sources of knowledge. All classification give attention to all kinds of knowledge that is not just Islamic traditional sciences, they have both, okay? A few of the correct sciences should be among the core subjects. And all public Muslim schools should ensure that traditional Islamic sciences are integrated in its curriculum, especially as its core. Uh, they want be, in Malaysia, we don't have to worry about that, okay? Now, look at this. This is the curriculum of Western University, okay? What they had was they have different uh, divisions of knowledge. So they have uh, humanities, social science, uh, natural science, applied science, and so on. So these are different disciplines. And uh, they don't, they used to have divinity before, but now there is no school of divinity in Harvard or in Yale. In fact, the School of Divinity among the first school to establish the university in America because they got it from, from Paris, okay? Uh, Paris, the, the Christian Paris broke to London, London, they go to America, okay? But they don't have that divinity anymore. So what they have in the core is they take a little bit from each of the uh, discipline. So uh, if you study, let's say, uh, this is in America, okay? I studied there for my bachelor degree, okay? You study you want to be a physics major, physics specialist, you still have to study a little bit of uh, sociology, anthropology, economics, you know, the social science, okay? Uh, this is what they call general education. And this was formulated by the Harvard committee, I think in 1946. And they stick to this until today because it works, because it works. I am a manifestation of that, okay? In other words, Although I was studying mathematics, I had to study all the natural, uh, all, I had to study one course and let's say in biology, one course in, and I minor in chemistry. And then uh, I have to study sociology, I have to study political science. I have to take one courses each, you know? 
And what it works because it opens up, it opens up my mind to the world of knowledge. I contrast myself to my colleagues who study in England, for example, okay? In UK, they are so specialized. They want to study mathematics, they, they study mathematics from year one to year three. So when we were teaching in, in Mara Junior Science College or MRSM, I can say that my colleague from England are very well established in that field of study. But for us, if you study in America, you have a general education. If you want to know more, you have to study your master's degree. That's why we left after we studied our master's degree, not bachelor degree. Then you specialize when you're doing a master's degree, not at, the, not at the bachelor degree. That's the difference. But in terms of my knowledge of the world, my ability to communicate and speak, I'm much better than my, my UK colleague. So that is the difference. You have to understand this, okay? Because of their curriculum structure and because of their what they want to produce. Uh, in our case, uh, we have adopted, let's say, Alata's uh, point here. Alata says that knowledge reflects men and the curriculum should reflect knowledge and men. Okay, so we have in the beginning, man has the outer parts, the physical part, and man has a soul. Okay, so that's good. And then in terms of knowledge, knowledge has uh, knowledge is associated to man. There's knowledge for the soul, and that is the Fadu'ain. And there's knowledge for the outer parts, the faculties, and that is the, the Fardu Kifaya. Okay, or the Akliya science. Now, when it comes to Curriculum, mm. uh, this is what we had again okay, in the beginning. Uh, so we have a core, but our core in even the IIUM was only the RIKHS sciences. You notice, okay? And RIKHS has a discipline by itself, but all the others, I don't know whether all the others, I think, yeah, in the beginning of IIUM, they have to take this core. And this core is from IIKHS. In the beginning, I think it was like, what, 21 credit hours? So seven subjects or nine subjects? So lot, eh? it's big as minor in the beginning. But later, this core, RKHS, was, which was under the, uh, the Sheikh of Kulia. I remember Prof. Kama was the Sheikh once, okay? Uh, then, because of the external uh, order, I think, from the ministry, you have to trim down. You have to trim down the, the core. So it become less. So if you look today, how many hours core courses we have and what are the core today? We used to have, uh, the core is fiqh, ethic, I think da'wah, and then you have the other Arabic, uh, Quran, tilawah, and then, and then now we have uh, what? Uh, titas, 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 gone, titas is changed with philosophy, I think, and issues. There are some changes, but we have a core. That, that is our core. So in other words, everyone, whether you are doing engineering, economics, or, or medicine, you have to take the Islamic studies core, okay? Islamic review core. Oops. Uh, I think this is repetition. Uh, I think I've mentioned this. My problem with IIUM is for students who are doing the non-SNT fields. Because if you look at the, this one, oops, sorry, but yeah. Yeah, uh, maybe I should go to the next one. Yeah. It will come up in the recommendation or reform, but anyway, where is it? Student from the non SNT fields, for example, student in social science or student in RIKHS, and yeah, basically RIKHS in economics, okay? They are not exposed to the mode of knowing and thinking in a scientific, social scientific way because they're only required to take core courses from the IRK. So this is my concern. In other words, you're not exposing them to different, different uh, ways of knowing, but they are good in uh, Islamic studies field, but not the, the psychology, sociology, and so on. Only the IRK student have to take the human science. So that is uh, the, li the, the limitation, okay? For university. So in terms of reform, what we have done in the past was we integrated education. We bring back the soul of Islamic education. That means we bring back natural science into the uh, madrasa and we bring back the, the, the fadu'ain into the, into the national school system. Okay, so we bring back the, the mind and also the soul. 
and we change teachers' pedagogical approach uh, to be balanced, and we hope to get the balanced good Muslim. Okay. Secondly, we did the IOK uh, uh, with different approaches. Like Akib Alatas was more interested in the Islamic worldview, and Al Faruqi was more interested in uh, integrating knowledge of the human uh, what do you call this uh, Western secular knowledge with Islamic values. He said create two anthologies and get but to do that you need to give birth to the scholars first okay and that is our students generation they should be writing by now they should be able to try to write something uh, that that is Islamic Islamic psychology uh, I, I think Prof Malik Badri has done a lot on layer there okay so we have to do Islamic sociology but not but a, a textbook as comparable to the West okay so I think I do have to talk about this. Okay, now let's look at the learning outcomes. If you look at the learning outcomes, of this, I don't know whether this is still relevant or not. I am learning outcomes. You have knowledge, practical skills, social skills, responsibilities, values, attitudes, communication, problem solving skill, skill, skill. Then last part here, I okay. I know, I know whether we still have this. <laughs> Maybe I'm, I'm barking at the wrong tree. <laughs> if it's not true. But what happened is that if you look at all this, uh, you notice that our concern is like what we said earlier. We are more like the businessmen. We are only interested in skills. Skills, problem solving skills. Where is the compassion? Where is the morality? Where is the character building? Even leadership, where's leadership? Leadership and team skill. There's nothing about, uh, okay, demonstration of interpersonal skill. Okay, interpersonal skill, but where is the character building in terms of uh, compassion, uh, empathy. This, this is this is what uh, I think we have to look back because otherwise we are still following the the business or marketing model. We have knowledge is good, practical skill or the one here, yeah? social skill, communication skill. Some communication with empathy. You you don't uh, you only do, you will put empathy only with communication. Empathy should be. In most things, it should be with the social skill as well. But anyway, uh, this is what uh, the learning outcome that we have. Uh, I don't know whether it has changed, but we have to look, okay? Uh, if you want to change to become more human, okay? Oops, sorry. So what I propose in terms of my recommendation, this is where I said just now, uh, we need to have another core. We only have Islamic living knowledge core, but we need to add another layer, and that is the in, acquired intellectual science core. And everybody has to take these two domain. You see, you see my point? I hope that they understand. <laughs> then only you become, become very versatile. Uh, you, have, you have the wisdom, not only Islamic, but also the humanities, sociology. I mean, it, it's like following the Americans, but it's necessary. If I don't study psychology, I don't know human being. If I don't study sociology, I don't know society. And we are depriving our students of this knowledge. Uh, I know our, our, our credit hours are already so much, but this is what general education is all about. It's for humanity, unless you just want to produce workers. And even today, even if we try to produce uh, workers, it will never mesh anymore with the AI and IR4 4.0, there is no more way to mesh. And that's why today we have many, uh, what do you call people, they say they're unemployed because they're not trained. If they, you give them a general education, they can do anything. Provided they are, no, the most important thing now is their character. They have to be diligent, disciplined. That's the kind of thing we have to work on them. Rather than we give them, uh, let's say they, they're working for an, a job, wow. you know, vocation. So I think this is something uh, that we have to change. So my recommendation is that IRK courses should not repeat what students have already learned through their 12 years basic education. IRK shouldn't be teaching just ethics, da'wah, you know, because they have been, students, if they've studied this for 11 years, I think it'd be boring to be repeating. How did I manage after 11 years I went to America? It's a kind of, I don't study this in school, but when I listen to talk, it's a different kind of talks. What is it? Islamic philosophy and history, survey courses on this, Western philosophy and history, 
readings of the Quran and Hadith as reference. Selected classic work. You can read, you know, Tufai, Nusina. Let them read something that will, they will make use of their brain to really understand it. Of course, you can introduce logic. And then you can produce anthologies as suggested by Faruqi. So I think this is something that we ought to be doing. I know I was in the uh, review for only a short while with Prof Tahe, and then I was I was left out. I don't know why. <laughs> so this the second thing for us, we have to review the lecturer's teaching method. Uh, I can safely say that when I was teaching. Uh, uh, student from IRKHS, when they were doing their master's or PhD, they will say that across the river, we cannot argue with our professor. We must just say yes. I said, huh, really? No. If you want critical thinking, creative thinking, spiritual thinking, social ethical thinking to get you that wisdom, there has to be, there has to be discussion and dialogue. And I'm not talking about debates because debate always want to win even if it's wrong. No, we're not talking about debate, like a lawyer, okay? <laughs> Forgive me, lawyers. We want discussion, dialogue, dialogue, okay? So you must have dialogue. And then when you have that dialogue, then you have critical thinking because you have to, to defend your point. Oh, there are lots of things to discuss, but never mind. The point is, I'm saying is that your lecturers, our lecturers have to be able to use better pedagogy. Sometimes they use technology, but they talk to the screen. They don't talk to the students. Then they look at the board and they talk to the board. I mean, <laughs> so it fails. There has to be a lot of discussion. You have to change the technique of teaching. And finally, assessment method. We don't assess based on, uh, of course, all of you know this about assessment, okay? But the point now is that you don't just dig up information because they can find that anywhere. You need to be more creative in asking questions, to see whether they are critical or not in their answer, whether they can defend, they can give uh, methods and means, and they have, of course, they have problem solving uh, skills through problem solving through project and so on. So we have to review this. And then inshallah, we can, we can have our renaissance in learning and we produce the wise student because now they know many things, not just the one thing that they're studying. They are going to be wise if they're exposed to many things, they have their background on Islam. They have their background on human being, human sciences. They have background on the scientific knowledge, how to do experiment. I mean, not so much of doing experiment because they are not science major, but at least the philosophy of science, what scientists are trying to do, what are their methods, you know? So they try, at least they have a scientific mind and they help them in their research, quantitative research method, okay? So I think uh, I've taken a long time. So that is what we want in terms of Islamic learning for a wise, for a wise uh, graduates, okay? And that's it, thank you for listening. Okay, okay now I'm, we can discuss. <laughs> Sorry, yeah? All right. Start uh, sharing? Okay. Thank you very much, Professor Rosnani, for a comprehensive talk on education for wisdom, conditions for higher education curriculum. Now I open the session for uh, any questions from the participants or viewers, either through Zoom or YouTube, please. I think in the chat box, huh? is there anything in the chat box? Uh, no, not in the chat box. In the chat box. I see 16, what are they doing? Yeah. Or else, uh, uh, okay. one question from my colleague here. Um, Prof. Rosdani, um, the question is, um, you talk about practical intelligence. Well, uh, in your point of view, how to inculcate this practical intelligence in our current curriculum and how to implement this? Uh, this practical intelligence. Let me give you the story that I heard from, from uh, Stenberg when I, was, when I listened to him in Singapore. <laughs> he said that, Let's, let's imagine that there are two, two children. Uh, they, they are about the same age. And one is high IQ, and the other one has a, a average IQ. And they went into the forest, OK? And when they went into the forest, they met a big black figure. So you can imagine what that black, big black figure is. Can you? What is it? 
the bear, okay? <laughs> it's a bear. So the, the low IQ uh, child didn't pause to think of anything, but just to turn and run because he doesn't want to be consumed or eaten by the bear. But the smart student was thinking of uh, how, how fast can the, will the bear run and how fast can he run and can the bear overtake him? So in between the two of them, who will, who will be the best victim? Definitely the, the one who is behind, right? And the one behind is a smart one. So, so he, he's, he has high IQ, but because he doesn't have practical intelligence, he, he will be, he be swallowed by the bear. But the other one, yes, practical intelligence, oh no, a bear. A bear means he can run and eat me. So this is from his experience and from his, uh, his knowledge. So he runs. So that's practical intelligence. But the question is, you ask how to get practical intelligence, okay? And this is where I, I, I thought of my hikmah pedagogy. My pedagogy is a pedagogy whereby you encourage students to become critical and creative at the same time, caring. Also, communicative and collaborative. In this pedagogy, see, I, I've been lecturing you for almost one half hours. I lectured. I brought even thinking stories just now, but there's no way I can give you thinking stories, okay? What I mean is that in this pedagogy, we give them a stimulus material, either it's text from your textbook or stories that you take, or text from the newspaper, whatever, or, the, or editor's uh, letter to the editor. Our translator has written a lot. Can take any article, weird, for example, okay? <laughs> and then ask them to read, and then raise questions. Practical intelligence come, first of all, just now we talk about wonder and reverence, right? Wonder and reverence. Asking questions, wondering, why? Why did the boy run first? Why? The, the wondering question is the why question. So when, after they ask the question, then you discuss among the students. You can pick up which question you want to ask. You can do it one by one. Okay, let's ask the first, first question. You don't answer as a teacher. If you answer as a teacher, you're giving it away. You're giving the fun of learning. What is the fun of learning? The fun of learning is the student themselves try to answer that question or point out what's wrong with the question, raise anything with that question. So from there, you can see that you're developing their mind. Practical intelligence means developing their mind to be practical. And then you start the discussion. The discussion will start because you have to, as the lecturer now, you have to put yourself backward. You don't, don't act as you're the sage on the stage. In the past, teachers are sage on the stage, which means Whenever there's a question, I will answer that question. I'm the know-all. <laughs> okay. Then you took away the, the fun of learning. But as a sage by the side now, that means you're a facilitator, okay? You ask, you throw the question back to the student. Well, who can, who can defend? Who can uh, argue? Okay. Uh, do you agree with him? What, has, what are your evidence? So, I, I mean, that's how you, that's how you, you uh, encourage students to keep thinking because you're not giving answer, but you are the teacher, you are probing, you're giving questions. Other students also begin to ask questions. So now it's a very interesting class because the teacher is not teacher centered, it is learner centered, and everyone has a fair chance of participating. So practical intelligence can mean also your experience, life experience. Okay? So that is, the more you do something, then the more you have uh, experience. That's why it's called practical experience. So uh, I believe um, uh, that is one, one of the way. Uh, make our student speak. Remember, I told you now that student from the, across the river, they say, when it comes to education, you're not supposed to speak. And in this class, you're supposed to speak. I know of lecturers, okay, who use PowerPoint and then ask students to present, so they present, and there's no discussion, no discussion. So what can the student gain? The student will say that I, I pay so much to enter this university, okay? And I come to this class, I present, and the lecturer just sit down, no comment, no question, no discussion, because there are so many students waiting their turn to present, 
Is that education? I've seen that. Student complain when I was the dean. I know because I was the dean, so I I to attend. I, I have to listen to them because that's right. They paid a lot. It came from Singapore, from whatever, especially the Singaporean. <laughs> so I sat in the class because I want to, before I can say anything, I said, okay, never mind. Let me investigate. I sat in the class and true enough. So I had to advise the lecturer. Our job is not just, uh, they're asking, but you don't take any part. You don't need question. You don't even ask a discussion. This is like primary school or secondary school, you know. Even in secondary school now, they're better. So this is, if you want, if you want students to have better critical thinking, better creative thinking, because when you ask them to give evidence, give example, they will have to be creative. Okay. So this is where the discussion, they learn, they get more and more knowledge because they, I know, for example, okay, the student, when they have a class where there is active discussion, it's easier for them to write. And you ask them, why now, before you write only one page, now you write two pages, why? They say that because I have more ideas now. Now, where did they get the ideas? They get the ideas from listening to their, their fellow, fellow students. So they have more, more ideas to write. Writing requires ideas, isn't it? So they have more ideas that they can write. So there has to be a way, we have to change our way of teaching. Not just be the sage on the stage. We can be the sage at the side. Our role is more important because we throw a question to lead the direction of the discussion. Okay. So that we have finally at the end, we reach a certain, certain, uh, if not consensus, a better understanding. It's right, it's better understanding. The question now is how do you measure, right? How do you measure understanding? And that's why you have uh, behaviorists like, like uh, Skinner and so on. They see the change. You can solve three problems in, in uh, out of five. <laughs> so that is a change that we should understand. No. This change is only obvious to the teachers. So the teacher has to give qualitative comments. Ahmad, before this, was a very quiet student, never participate in class. After two classes of this type, I noticed that he has begun to speak, he has begun to raise questions. That's the kind of that's the kind of qualitative assessment we are making. We are not business people, <laughs> okay? So then, then we can bring the humanity. Even in this, in this, uh, we are caring thinking, especially values, okay? Compassionate and uh, empathy and so on. This depends on your on your material that you give for, for your reading discussion. So I hope uh, it's clear. Yes, uh, thank you, Prof. We have one question from mm -hmm. YouTube. Um, Mustafa Kamal bin Osman, KPM Guru. Um, mm -hmm. Prof, what is your opinion on the curriculum we have such as IR 4.0? Uh, is he referring to the curriculum IR 4.0 in the Ministry of Education? Or is it in the university? Or what? I would say because this one is from KPM. KPM. Mm -hmm. I think uh, from Ministry of Education. Uh, I'm not so sure what they are having in IR 4.0 in the Kementerian. Uh, but as, as, as it is right now, as a result of the pandemic, we noticed that uh, they had gone uh, from non-use of ICT to a greater use of ICT because of the pandemic. So the pandemic accelerated it, okay? But now they are back to uh, back to face-to-face. -to -face. So I don't know whether they have any uh, blended, learning, uh, blended learning or not, okay? As to IR 4.0, I don't know what they're doing. So I cannot, I cannot comment on that. Uh, I've not read anything on that, so I'm so sorry. But even the university, we 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 we're not embarking on IR 4.0 except for except for let's say uh, the, those doing engineering, I think, and 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 science. They can maybe the audience can answer. Then see, this is what is talk about uh, pedagogy. I'm not the one to answer alone. I can depend on 
any of my students who know better than me. <laughs> okay. So there is a community in search of knowledge. Ah. Okay, we have questions. Uh, okay. Professor Ratnawati, maybe uh, from the chat thank box. You. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Kamil. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Rusnani, for a very interesting talk. Uh, Doc, uh, Prof. Rusnani and I have been <laughs> colleagues or perhaps friends ever since we were, we were in high school, from high school to university and, and, uh, and then to IIM. But anyway, uh, the, my question is this. Um, I think with regard to, I do agree with Prof. Rusnani that when students ask questions, and this, but this depends on the nature of the question and the intent of the pedagogy, uh, the intent of the, you know, what, what it is that we're trying to achieve. If we want to make them think, perhaps we, uh, uh, maybe not just perhaps, if you want to make them think, we can, uh, you know, it's much better not to give them the answer immediately. Mm -hmm. uh, but I also do feel that, uh, you know, we, we have to have uh, the balance. And that is, it's not that the teacher is just a facilitator full stop and that's, that's it. Uh, so it's not about being a sa the sage on the stage. But in between, uh, you know, the teacher can guide uh, the students, maybe not by giving the answer immediately, but by guiding them mm -hmm. to ask more questions, uh, to listen, ask more questions, because there are some aspects where the teacher has to guide mm -hmm. certain aspects. It's, it's not, you know, it's not, uh, uh, you know, the students reaching uh, something, uh, you know, that, that's totally unguided by the teacher, in my mm -hmm. view, because otherwise uh, it will be, I mean, for example, the question of values, the question of values, uh, there might be so much relativity that, uh, well, this is what I say, this is what I think. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, what makes what you think better than the way I think, for example. So, so I mean, I'm just saying, I, I know that yeah. people probably doesn't mean it. Uh, uh, for yeah, yeah, yeah. Siapa tu? <laughs> To take, it this way, to take it this way but uh but you know so, so prof i i'm 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 just uh, mm -hmm. saying that you know if we are concerned about critical thinking uh i think this is an excellent uh method where we get the students uh, you know we they ask a question and we ask them more questions and we use a questioning technique to lead them to something mm -hmm. uh but not to end mm -hmm. with questions that may not have any answers at all. <laughs> so that, that's my concern because there are certain things that do have answers. Mm -hmm. Certain things yes. do have answers and, and not everything uh, ends answerless, mm -hmm. for example. So that, that's my view. Uh, what, what, uh, you know, perhaps it would be good if you might want to respond to that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Pahrana. Yeah, you got, it. you got the method, you got it right. Yes. As I told just now, in terms of yes, to staff is people artistically, right? So it's not just employing that one method all the time, you know. So at one time you 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 use your PowerPoint, but still the whatever you use, it will come back to if you want critical thinking student, you come back to asking questions, like what Prof. Anna mentioned, okay? And you cannot leave it hanging like that. Of course, definitely not. We try to come to a certain consensus. Okay, if you're talking about relativity of values, it's uh, a bit easier on a homogeneous classroom. If they all belong to the Islamic faith, then they they have the criteria of the Quran and the Sunnah. But you don't bring the Quran and the Sunnah so early into the discussion because it will stop the discussion. You bring the Quran and the Sunnah as criteria when you reach a point where you are arguing and. You think that there is no there is no consensus. Then somebody remember, oh, there is this. They they quote this ayat, and then they discuss the ayat, and then they, they will probably agree with something. But there but there are things that not, that are in the shade of gray. There might be uh, two opinions, uh, but as long as it's not 
it's not a very uh, serious matter. It's a petty thing. Let them stick with their opinion until they met. They met. They got their wisdom. I mean, when we experience something, <laughs> your wisdom. I, okay. I agree with you, bro. I agree with you. It's just that, uh, because that part was not emphasized, you know. Uh, so, yeah. so it it may have uh, different meaning. I wanted to have it clarified. Okay. I want. Okay. So I do. I do agree with you. Uh, uh, there are many shades of gray. There are gray areas, uh, mm. and this is where you know we 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 can. What do you think? What do you think? You know. So, mm -hmm. so, uh, but there are some aspects perhaps that may not be as grey mm. as uh, some others. So, so I just wanted to have that clarified. Thank you, Prof. Yeah, thank you, Prof. Right now. I All think right, that's clear. Uh, we have a question from Dr. Tahrawi, please. Mm -hmm. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu uh, Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Rosnani, for this uh, lecture. Alhamdulillah, we learned a lot from you as usual. Um, the reality today is that education uh, is Marx-driven. Uh, it is commercialized and most curriculum designers are interested in the production of skilled students for employment later on. Even IIUM cannot escape such outcome. And surely the sponsors of this university would, would want to get some return for their investment. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you foresee, Prof, okay. the best strategy that I, IUM should take to face uh, such challenge and stay relevant also to its principles? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Murat. Very important question again. Uh, actually, actually, this is where we can lead. Okay, because uh, we cannot prepare students for a job today. That's why they're not coming. Because if they if they are from the B40, they don't have the money to pay for the expenses. They have to depend on PTPTN, and then at the end of the uh, course, there's no work. And how do they pay them back? Even the PTN to PTPTN today uh, bore uh, what 40, 40 millions uh, and and and. Uh, People are not paying because they don't, they're not working and they don't have the money. And if they are working, the, the salary is very low, you know, in Malaysia. So, so rather than lose on both ends, you know, we are losing and uh, we students don't come anymore. Give them general education. You know, we should stop the employer from saying that we are, should train them for their, for their company. No. We are training our students to become wise and intelligent and can use the knowledge that they have. And that's why with the knowledge that they have today, they can work by themselves. Some of them, if they are diligent and enterprising, they start something. But I don't like if many of them become only riders of grabs. That's a sad thing. I recently went to a workshop to repair my television, LCD, you know, and the man was complaining, cannot find worker. And I said, why don't you get the SPM and you know the diploma students? You no, know, they don't want. Why they don't want? Because the pay is little. And then they prefer to be riders because they don't have to acquire any skill. Mm -hmm. They just write and deliver. That's very sad. Because people don't know. This is where they, the wisdom there is lost. They don't know what to value in life. If that work with this guy, I would imagine that they will acquire the skills of repairing television, microwave, so, so many electrical gadgets. After let's say of three years of working, they can open up their own their own shops. So this is where the wisdom is lost, and that's why I feel that. And in fact, if you read the literature, I think even in America, they they are they are defending their general education because this is the way to go. Because you can't train a student for for, for a particular job now, unless you are talking about professional courses like legal, legal law, education, medicine, but you're talking about social science, human science. Uh, that's why you, you need to, to give them that. Let them decide after they graduate what, what to pursue. Because I think, I think if you are trying to that's why the ministry has to understand this. Mohi has to understand this. They have to study the concept in other countries as well. You know, when the system is stable, that means it's good. 
that the American system has been stable, they never change. They never change the curriculum structure. So for us, I'm just suggesting we change our core. Our core should be broader, not just IRK. And then uh, for the uh, RIK, they have the human science. But for the rest, they only have IRK. There's no human science. There is no sociology, psychology. So this, this, this is about the people, about men. The human science, that's why it's called human science. And the humanities, history, philosophy, this is about men. This will give them the wisdom. And with that knowledge, if they will pursue master's degree, they can utilize that knowledge. And if they don't utilize that knowledge, they have not lost anything because as a person, they have become a more rounded and better person. You see? So that's a big difference. So uh, if we cannot, uh, what actually has happened is that in the university core courses across the university, before I left the university with Mohi, they have agreed to offer falsafah uh, dan issues masa, philosophy and current issues, as one course to take over from TITAS. Okay? But the question now is, they don't have enough philosophers to teach that course. So you have to prepare the groundwork. But anyway, uh, we gave them the, we, we developed, uh, uh, what do you call this, uh, video for the lecturers. Because when I told them, read the philosophy book, they read the introduction, and then they start teaching philosophy uh, historically. Okay? <laughs> Not philosophy for thinking, okay? So this is this is the difference. But this is, in other words, at least there's a change the, to bring in philosophy for thinking in the core course. So the, so 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 I think if the Mohi can go there, that was when Mazali was around. He understood us. Our rector was so there, you see. So now and Prof. Usman Baka was also there. So I think whoever is the next Ministry of Higher Education. Hopefully he's an educationalist. That's the problem. Because you get a politician who doesn't come from education background, they won't understand this. Maybe we have to, maybe we have to write. Maybe we have to write and convince them. So this, this is this is uh, this is the issue. We have to give general education so that they can be generalists. They can be anything after they graduate. If they want to have more knowledge on something, they do their master's degree. Then many people will come to the university for master's degree as well. I hope I answer your question. Yes, uh, thanks. We, Thank you very we, much, we Prof. Have, we have to have the courage. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. <laughs> SAF have got to have the courage. <laughs> okay. right. Thanks, okay. Prof. We have uh, uh, Prof. Mira here to raising hand. Uh, maybe okay. one, yeah, because it's fine. Prof. Mira? Yes. All right. Thank you so much, Prof. Uh, it's very yeah. inspiring. And I always learn from you, Alhamdulillah, Zakila Khair. <laughs> but um, regarding generalist or um, specific, I think I would leave it for now <laughs> because I think it's going to be a long debate. Uh, but I'm, I'm very interested on the one that you mentioned just now on the feedback. So just want to share, recently I conducted a research where mm -hmm. we actually asked what the lecturers perceive on the uh, graduates' uh, attributes. What are the students, what do you think the mm -hmm. students learn the most? So it is very interesting that the lecturers say that the, the thing that the students learn the most from their course is the skills and knowledge. And we ask the same <laughs> thing to the students. What do you learn the most from the course? The students said values. <laughs> so what, what, what is interesting is that we have a different perceptions. The students have different perceptions. And just to validate, just to get some ideas, after the, after the Congo, the students actually came to see me. Uh, and then I asked the same thing. From my class, what do you learn the most? And they said, um, I remembered when you say that uh, what makes a pharaoh uh, collapse is not because of uh, the knowledge, uh, but because of his arrogance. But because of his arrogance. So... Uh, I remember that the most, madam. So we have to avoid being arrogant and we have to keep learning. So, mm -hmm. uh, 14 weeks of topics, <laughs> they remember the most, but we seldom give feedback on that. We seldom assess that. So, I think this is a very important thing uh, uh, that you mentioned just now, Prof. Feedback on the things that doesn't come to the grade that we often forget. So, in, in what way would you feel that it, as an educationist, uh, in what way you would assess those values in our course as I mean like 
personal assessment. We evaluate ourselves and how do we evaluate students when it comes to things that is not graded? Thank you, bro. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it's my, uh, maybe to share with you my practice was that uh, at the end of the course, every semester, I would ask them to write something. Give me your feedback about the course, uh, mm -hmm. the course uh, content, the delivery of the course, Okay, and then uh, the instructor, you know, and what you learn from this course. So it is qualitative. You cannot you cannot make it quantitative because different students will have different feedback, right? But uh, but if you want it to be, and and that's why we have journals journals writing because journal will they will express what they learn. Unless you want to say what skills you learn, then you write down what skills, you know. And then what, uh, what values, what, what will be specific. But it has to be written because it is from them. It has to be qualitative. And uh, I remember this first chess person from Sweden, when he asked, when somebody asked him, uh, uh, how do you know that this method is doing the good service to the student? He said that I, I don't measure things. I look at their faces. <laughs> that means very deep. they're happy and that's, that means they, they, they learn you know so this is uh, so qualitatively it's difficult to measure understanding and uh, what do you call this uh, values it's really difficult to measure unless you want to put there's another, another rubric is you put uh, a statement then strongly disagree disagree agree strongly uh, agree and strongly agree uh, you give them that, that uh, what do you call this, uh, freedom to choose. And then from there, you, you will, you will uh, combine all the students' uh, results, how many strongly agree, then you know. But you have to give the statement. You have to give the statement. Okay, so can I say that you are not, uh, you are not into measuring, but more Yeah, I'm not into quality. measuring. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so that's yeah. very interesting. Okay, we, so we, we one, keep that. Ask, ask the measurement people to work on it. <laughs> <laughs> that's very important, Prof. Inshallah, we will keep that for the next BTMC. Thank you. Thank, thank, you, thank you, Prof. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. You, yeah, thank you. Maybe a quick one from Dr. Abdul Hamid, please. Assalamualaikum. Can you hear me? Assalamualaikum. How are you, Prof? Mashallah, wonderful, as you always do. Very <laughs> uh, I, I, I had a small comment regarding uh, specializations. Uh, we, we tend to understand that Murabi is, uh, is the one who has Islamic background, uh, lecturers in, in RKHS or Islamic economics. But in fact, we have now we aim to inculcate the, the, the understanding that all lecturers in IUM should be Murabi whether you are in engineering or uh, medical sciences or, or laws, wherever you are, you are Murabi. So if you have this in, in our mind, inshallah, our, our students will understand this as well. Uh, and also the way how we, we interact with our students, uh, the wisdom that we, we, we instill. If, if we think that we are only teaching mathematics, or biology or chemistry, nothing to do with, with Tawheed or with, the Tawhidic ideas or uh, Islamic worldview, uh, then it's, it's, a, it's a big loss. Uh, so IUM is a garden of knowledge and virtue. So based on this slogan or, or theme of IUM, uh, virtue should be everywhere. And as you have just said, Prof, uh, and rightly, uh, wisdom is one of the main uh, components of, 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 of gaining knowledge. So in this garden of knowledge and virtue, all lecturers should uh, what you call it is still in the minds of the students that you are here as, as a, a student, not only of uh, what you call uh, a normal discipline, gaining mm -hmm. knowledge in, in, in your career or in your department, and that's it. You are Khalifatullah, and this has, has to be shown in the lecture themselves. When they mm -hmm. come to the class, they have to say, Salaamu Alaikum, start with something good. When the students say, Salaamu Alaikum, they have to reply, Alaikum Salaam. This is how we understand European terbiyah is not only for RK students or lecturers, only those who are teaching Sharia, they have to inculcate values, they have to teach students Islamic wisdoms. I think this is uh, something very 
common, very, very, something very, what you call, uh, you need to, 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 to mention IUM. What makes us different is that we are in this garden of knowledge and in virtue, in whatever uh, subject we teach, in whatever uh, discipline we are under, undertaking, we have to inculcate moral values. So students will understand that this lecturer in the uh, Kuliah of uh, Medicine or Engineering, whenever he comes to teach, he or she is coming to teach also akhlaq, uh, tarbiya. So he is Murabi by default. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Yes. Yes, I think, I think my comment will be brief. Every one of us, uh, are Murabi, Muadib, Mualim, Mudaris, okay, <laughs> Murshid. Different, different level yet. Okay, unless we're interested in doing the south, we can have a worship in our way. But we can, we can, uh, like uh, Allah Yarham Malik Badri was also worship actually. So, yes, everyone is a Murabi, but he has to understand that. Okay, and that's why he has to have a sense of mission. And you can't have that sense of mission unless you're exposed to it. And that's where the Islamic worldview come, becomes very important, not just to be taught as a, as a subject. But to be internalized, okay, and uh, moral values it can be taught bil lisan or bil hal, as you know, Dr. Hamida. So uh, we don't have to say something so much. Sometimes students will understand us from our action. If you talk about, if you preach, okay, be punctual, but you come to class late, okay. So what's the point? It is, uh, it is like you're not walking your talk. So it's better if you don't talk. But in terms of character, in terms of character, you come punctually, you, you are brave to defend the, the truth, even you have to go to court. <laughs> that, that was among my last experience at IUM. <laughs> we have to go to court, okay? <laughs> because we were, we were interested in, in defending the values of IUM, okay? So we have to go to court. Uh, we lost, but I said, no problem, nobody look down upon me even if I lost, okay, because it's necessary, not necessary you get a justice in the court, you know, justice with God, okay, but, but this is where we talk about character, character means it is something that you live and students see, it. students see your wisdom, students see your bravery, students see your courage, students see your, your patience, perseverance, and so on, so you don't talk so much, you don't preach ethics anymore, because they are dark students already, but they see you. That's most important. They see you. When you teach, they, they can know whether it is coming from the heart or it's just the, the, the mind and, the, and the, the mouth, okay? Nothing from the heart. So this is, yes, definitely, every one of us is a Murabi, but we have to know what is our mission. And we have to have that mission because if we don't, in fact, in fact IOM has a mission and vision. So if we don't have that mission, then we be lost. But anyway, regarding our student, I did a survey about 159 students. It was about one years back, six years back maybe. Okay, about what IIUM has given them. Many of them came here for Islam and they got it. They strongly agree they got it. They came here for Arabic and English. They uh, they got English, not so much Arabic. They got English, brotherhood. Okay, they got brotherhood. Uh, there are a couple of things that uh, is quite positive. In our, in other words, our our graduates very appreciative what the university is doing to them. My concern is if you want to inculcate values, let's, let's, let's ignore that because they have been trained for 11 years in school about values, okay? Give them now what is the philosophy of ethics. In other words, you can think of ethics from the revealed knowledge, also ethics using your mind. Using your mind, okay? For example, I studied when I was doing my uh, PhD, Plato. I realized that Plato knew the existence of hell and heaven rationally. There was no kitab for him, but he said that it's not fair if people are receive injustice in the world today, right? And then they just die like that. There must be, uh, 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 what do you call this? Punishment for those who have done, given them this injustice. So but because of that, he believed that there is the, there is the hell and heaven. Okay, so in other words, we have to train our students that they can use the rational, they can use wahyu, okay? But if God says that, God says that zina is haram, even if the rational says it's not haram, now look, look, discuss. Why? What's, what's the flaw in your, in, your, in your thinking? 
Same thing with LGBT or whatever. What's the flaw? So at least if you argue with them rationally, they can accept that. See, because the Quran leave the interpretation argument to us. The Quran give us only the principle. You have to argue for it. So that's what is wanted in even in Islamic studies. Okay, and so I'm more concerned with the Hikmah pedagogy in Islamic studies than in the the other the other quiet sciences. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, um, we can just read through the questions from the YouTube and also uh, Zoom here. We have three. Uh, mm -hmm. You might want to just combine the answer. Perhaps uh, mm -hmm. the first one is from Prof. Aziz, uh, Prof. Abdul Aziz. Your lecture looks urging us to move to the next phase of integration as we are entering the 40th anniversary of the university. Any wisdom on this? The second one is from Dr. Zaleha Kasim. Um, the question is related to the ability of our lecturers to teach something that they are still lacking in terms uh, the practical experience. Many just use whatever stated in some old textbooks. And the third one from YouTube from Hanani Ahmad Yusuf, how to tackle students who just focus to get good grade but not appreciate the skills she may get from the teaching and learning activity. For example, communication skills in group project activity. Please, bro. Wow, many questions. Huh? Okay. I think the first one is the most difficult one. <laughs> Let me look at uh, the, the question by Sister Zaleha. Ability to something lacking, practical experience. So that is why uh, in professional field, okay, like legal, law, like education, or medicine, you have to have experience. Maybe even architecture. Just ask Pro, uh, Dr. Norwina. She's here just now, okay, from architecture. Someone who just graduated in architecture without any practical experience, teach architecture with, let's say, Dr. Norwina, who has years of experience as an architect. Are they going to be the same? Definitely no. So that's why I remember when I was doing my master, after I completed my master, I wanted to do my PhD. So I went to the, to, the, uh, to see the dean, said, can I com uh, do, continue to the PhD? You know what he said? Rosnani, go back. Go back first, teach, find the problems, and then by then you can do your, you can do your PhD. That's why I said just now, most of the people working in the professional fields, teaching, they're not young people. So if we are concerned about that, Dr. Zaleha, then you should be recruiting the correct people. But I, I know because sometimes we, we, have, we, we don't have the correct people. We need the qual quantity, but we don't have the quantity. So we just take. But I remember my colleague in USM before, she came in the day after PhD and she was asked, she recruit, was recruited in education faculty, okay? And she didn't have any teaching experience. What USM did was send her to school send her to school for at least, I think, one or two semesters. So that she, so that when you speak to your student, who are sometimes already teachers, okay, they trust you, they respect you, because you're speaking from experience. So this is uh, something that is very true, and uh, something has to be done. That's why the, the staff recruitment, recruitment committee in the Kulia should be aware of this. And uh, if you recruit someone who doesn't have experience, Ask them to go and get the experience at, at your expense. You pay for the salary, but they are teaching elsewhere. So we have to, because this is professional. So I said pro, for professional field like education, law, medicine, okay, uh, you name it, what? architecture, engineering, experience is very important. Give this give a lot of trust and respect uh, to, to all, okay? And then uh, the third one. Uh, students, teaching students for great. Excuse me. Uh, uh, so, oh, this kind of students. What do you do with this kind of student? Well, I, maybe from my experience, I can share with you is that they have not a field, uh, they have not uh, gotten the best uh, from studying without grades. Okay? Therefore, is the responsibility of the lecturer to expose these students to materials that that will that are wonderful, <laughs> materials that are wonderful, not for grades, 
but for maybe you're talking about caring thinking in there about ethics about moral values something that is inviting and exciting then they will start thinking of i should start reading uh, this is where i mean by saying that we should start reading we should start reading uh those that i said just now the classic they can even read a uh, classic in malay or classic in english or in the islamic world give them to read that challenge their mind and then they will say something they will see something of why because they can draw with them you see i i, I use hoja nasruddin i don't know how many of you are from turkey <laughs> okay hoja nasruddin is a fendi is a turkish teacher who is very famous is them and his story is very short i even use that to my grandchildren my grandson i asked him of course they like to play tablet right so i said before you, i can give you this phone of mine you read one story from hoja nasruddin and he will read the story and he got so engrossed with the story but i i will interview him for his understanding but there's richness in that story the story is not long so in other words sister zaliha give them something oh, not zaliha this one the last one give them something that uh will open the windows to another another world okay you understand what i mean so you you are the one who you are the one who guides you are the murabbi you are the murabbi you are the doctor you are the murshid so you this is one way you can do get something interesting and discuss it in class then i think they will read it inshallah and once they got the beauty of it uh, they will not forget you for introducing it to them and finally uh, prof uh, prof abdul aziz barut question about the 40th anniversary yes i uh, i feel i we have gone through integrated education to end educational dualism we have gone through islamization of knowledge okay and we have understood the concept uh, some do it very well some don't do it as well because it's our own uh, not because the concept is at fault but it's because of our our shortcoming so those with shortcoming they should read more works on islamic thoughts you cannot do islamization of knowledge if you don't read the book of qatas ismail faruqi said usain nas you know al ghazali al farabi you have to read you have to read the the islamic what we call the islamic uh, legacy legacy then only you can have the wisdom okay uh and i now come to focusing into the curriculum yes you are right that's right the curriculum at this stage of 40th anniversary maybe we should become what do you call this we should become uh, more generalist focus more on the methods of teaching so that our our students get the wisdom and find learning interesting as well okay and then we should focus on a different form of assessment so yes we have to we have to change gear education for wisdom okay <laughs> not education for islamization of knowledge for wisdom thank you i think uh, thank you prof uh, maybe before we end we hear a few words from uh, uh, dr lihana borhan our director of kca please assalamu alaikum i'll just take one minute to just say thank you so much uh, prof snani we're doing a lot and i also thank everyone for coming here and i hope this doesn't end here inshallah we'll have more with professor nani but also for people like me you know who are for people like us who are still going who who should go to classes perhaps inshallah this will for us to do better uh day in day out inshallah thank you so much bro you was welcome all right uh, thank you dr lihana and um, we truly appreciate uh, prof rosdani for this saf murabi uh, session and um, i i hope that we we have a blessed weekend yeah inshallah and i pass the session to our mc again please uh, sister zahira thank you uh, thank you uh, to for dr usman hashim and dr muhammad kamil hasan may our grand Uh, both of you with good health so that we will continue to benefit directly from your wisdom. So we, I believe we have learned and benefit so much during the past two hours. 
okay uh, thank you uh, i have an announcement to all participants is be informed that special talk on muslimah dilemma in japan will be held on 7 september 2022 so let us watch together the short video prepared by japan that was sent to osaka Wanita adalah kembar lelaki. Mereka bukan makhluk kelas kedua di belakang lelaki. Jika lelaki berhak untuk menyentuh ilmu, begitu juga wanita. Alhamdulillah di Malaysia kita bersyukur kerana kita mempunyai peluang yang banyak untuk kaum wanita menuntut ilmu tetapi perkara ini tidak berlaku kepada saudara kita di Jepun kenapa wanita-wanita di Jepun tidak mempunyai peluang yang luas untuk menuntut ilmu kerana batasan tempat dan juga lokasi untuk mereka Mereka merupakan jumlah muslim yang teramai di Jepun ya. oleh kerana fatwa yang berbeza di antara muslim pelbagai negara di Jepun mereka merupakan warga yang terpinggir sebenarnya Lalu bagaimana kita nak membantu mereka? Alhamdulillah, Jepun Dakwah Center di Osaka, bangunan dakwah yang menjadi milik melalui wakaf orang Malaysia akan membantu komuniti wanita di Jepun untuk membeli bangunan untuk menjadi tempat mereka belajar dan tempat pendudukan fokus pada warga Jepun muslimah yang memeluk Islam. Ini merupakan yang projek yang pertama seumpamanya. Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam sendiri berpesan dengan sabda baginda istausu bin nisa'i khaira. Berpesan-pesanlah supaya berbuat baik kepada kaum wanita. Dan antara satu cara kita berbuat baik kepada wanita adalah memberikan mereka peluang untuk menuntut ilmu. Bahkan mereka lebih penting untuk menuntut ilmu kerana mereka adalah guru, ibu yang akan mendidik generasi ummah. Oleh itu, kami mahu menjemput anda untuk membantu warga muslim majoriti di Jepun ini. Ayuh bersama-sama kami, Jepun Dakwah Center untuk mengutip dana membeli bangunan ini. Majunya wanita, majunya Islam di Jepun. Uh, Sarah Chikaku Takeuchi-san, who is an activist for the Japanese Muslim community living in Okayama, Japan, will deliver the TED Talk. Community living in Japan and also will discuss their needs for a shelter for women and children in Japan. May Allah is everything. With this, we have come to the end of our program. May Allah continue to provide us with his guidance, his guidance and protection. Thank you again, everyone, for joining this program. We end with Pastor Kafarov and Surah al -Han. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you.